So good morning, everyone, from the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies, or at least the remote location of two members of the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies. I am Jeff Payne coming uh, to you today uh, with, I believe, the 13th in our digital series on the Indian Ocean uh, maritime situation, which includes all things related to the maritime domain, as well as things related to the coast. It's not purely a security focused uh, series of discussions like the one today, while security related is not directly so in a traditional sense. I am joined by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Gaudet Bagat, who is uh, an expert on all things related to the Gulf, but with a speciality backed up by a long, long, long list of publications in various academic as well as popular sources. Um, on uh, the economic considerations of Gulf security analysis. So today we're gonna to be talking about the Gulf region um, and to an extent the wider Middle East as it relates to the economic considerations and how they play out uh, potentially in the maritime domain. And so with that, before turning it over to him, I'm gonna kick us off with a question. So Gaudat, my friend, the first question to you is how do economic considerations shape security efforts by Gulf states, and if you want to even take it on, the larger Indian Ocean region itself. Over to you, my friend. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you for inviting me, and it's a great honor to be on your program. And uh, economics is everything. Uh, almost with no exception, all of us, whenever we make any decision, we consider how much money we have, how much it will cost, how much we will spend. So uh, economics is a major issue in personal and nationwide uh, consideration. Uh, when it comes to uh, Gulf security, uh, Everything there is about oil. Without oil, we would not have known, many of us would not have recognized Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Qatar. Uh, they uh, became important players, both on the regional and international scenes because of oil, because they had a lot of money and their money comes from uh, exporting, selling oil and gas. So uh, I, I don't want to go into history, but uh, oil was discovered in the Gulf region. The first country was Iran, 1908, then Iraq, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and the rest. And uh, they basically, after Second World War, their oil industry uh, became very strong because there was more political stability worldwide. So uh, their oil industry was developed and they started accumulating a lot of money, especially after 1973 uh, war between Israel and Arab countries. This is known in oil history as the first oil shock when oil prices went very high and uh, the connection between security and economics uh, when they have a lot of money uh, they they buy weapons uh, without money they cannot buy they don't have the money to buy weapons and weapons uh, add to their security uh, many of these countries have state-of-the-art weapons from United States, from Europe, from Russia, from China. They have the best the money can buy. This is one aspect. The second aspect is uh, economics money uh, gives them political leverage, political influence, both inside their countries and outside their countries. A uh, good example, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the uh, crown prince of Saudi Arabia, is a very well-known figure all over the world uh, because Saudi Arabia, uh, probably in the last survey, is the third largest importer 
of arms in the world. After uh, India and I believe Russia, but uh, because Saudi Arabia uh, buys a lot of weapons, uh, every uh, corporation, every company makes arms, is interested in uh, selling them to Saudi Arabia. Uh, also because Saudi Arabia, Arab Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait, other countries have a lot of money, they have been able to uh, make their population happy. The way they, they use the money, they, uh, they are able to uh, establish the biggest welfare state in the world. Many things used to be uh, free or almost free, like education, uh, guaranteed employment, no taxes, all these things come because they have the money, so they have to spend it. Uh, so they are able to uh, provide for their citizens and people are happy. At the same time, if you are Emirati citizen, Saudi citizen, Kuwaiti citizen, you, if you disagree with the policy, you have to consider you are getting so much for free and if you oppose the government, you pay a very high price. So this is the reason uh, till today we have not seen any uh, grassroots opposition movement in any of the Gulf states. So probably to sum up, the connection between uh, money, economics, energy and security, uh, they give them leverage in the international scene because they have uh, the resources. So they are intervening in Libya, in Yemen, in Libya, all over the world. And second, uh, they, the money, the economics made them uh, stronger at home because they can, I don't want to say buy off the opposition, but they have the resources to provide free health care, to provide free education, to provide guaranteed employment for the population. Thank you. Thank you, Gadot. Um, that's a good jumping in point because one of the things that I'm struggling with looking at the Gulf Arab states um, specifically um, is it's clear that their economies are comprehensively, even though they're, they're, they're trying to escape uh, the reliance on natural resources, you know, the Saudi vision plan, the Emirati vision plan, the Qatari vision plan, they, all of these economies have, are trying to diversify, but they still are overly reliant on natural resource exports. Um, given that, that these countries are reliant on natural resources being exported to other markets, um, that means that they're going to be exported primarily and principally um, by the sea through a maritime route. But you brought up the fact that all of these states um, have bought the best money, uh, weapons that money can buy. They've invested in, in their militaries. But their coastal defense, as well as their navies and coast guards, are pretty undervalued. So can you explain to me the logic of why economies that are so reliant on trade are not committed to protecting that lifeblood as much as you would expect them to? Over. Uh, this is a great question and it is mind-boggling. Uh, none of the six GCC states has strong navy. Uh, United States has been uh, putting a lot of pressure on Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates to build strong Navy, to invest in their Navy. But my sense is uh, the leaders of these countries came to the conclusion that uh, the best way to defend themselves is to ally with United States. And uh, basically, uh, what is happening uh, where the economy till today runs on oil. 
uh, most Gulf oil and gas uh, is exported through the Strait of Hormuz, the Persian Gulf. And the uh, United States since 1980s has its uh, head, the headquarter of the fifth fleet in Bahrain. Uh, United States is committed to defend the uh, routes, maritime routes from uh, the Gulf to the rest of the world. Mainly from American perspective, United States has the largest economy in the world and the United States believes rightly that uh, to stabilize world economy, we need to guarantee the security of oil shipments from the Gulf to the rest of the world. Even in the last 10 years or so, uh, United States has been less dependent on uh, oil from the Gulf. Uh, China imports much more oil from the Gulf than the United States. But China does not uh, participate in Gulf security. The United States is the main guarantor of Gulf security. And it seems to me uh, the Gulf leaders, the leaders of, of GCC states, came to the conclusion that whatever they build will not be as strong as the American Navy, as the American commitment. So their naval strategy is to get closer to the United States, to buy more American weapons. This way, the United States is committed to uh, their security, to their time security. There are some holes, some gaps in this strategy. Uh, one of them, uh, because the United States is less dependent, and also not only the Trump administration, but Obama administration, and all American presidents have been committed to bring American troops home, have been committed that uh, Gulf countries should take the lead in Gulf security and maritime security. So uh, I believe the assumption that the United States will guarantee maritime security without uh, the stakeholders in the region, without regional powers, is wrong assumption. Uh, regional powers are trying to intervene, uh, trying to take the lead. Uh, Turkey uh, has military bases in Qatar. Uh, it's trying to uh, take the lead in maritime security in the Gulf uh, with the new normalization agreement between United Arab Emirates and Israel. It is probably too early to speculate what role Israel will have, but uh, I will not be surprised if uh, Israeli ships, Israeli submarines go to the Gulf. Uh, but till now, uh, everybody in the world is interested in maritime security in the Persian Gulf in Strait, in Strait of Hormuz, and what is happening, and this is my last point here, uh, many uh, Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and even Iran, are trying to find ways to export their oil without going through Strait of Hormuz. Uh, the Saudi Arabia has pipeline to uh, avoid Strait of Hormuz, United Arab Emirates, the same, and probably most recent, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, Iran started building a new port which will avoid Strait of Hormuz. So uh, this is how uh, basically till today United States is taking the lead in uh, maritime security and the Persian Gulf in Strait of Hormuz. Thank you. Let me return to what Based on what you just said, let me return to one of your early statements. You said that economics is everything. And it seems that increasingly that if it, if it is the case that, that a lot of Gulf states are betting on the United States and other 
uh, the United States allies to essentially maintain freedom of navigation and to protect commercial uh, shipping in and around and near uh, the Strait of Hormuz. But that seems to be a, a does it, isn't that a long-term miscalculation economically, given that the majority of the oil and natural gas that Qatar and Saudi Arabia and the Emirates are, are exporting is going east, is going to Japan, is going to Korea, uh, it, it's going to Vietnam, it's going to China, um, if, it, and it's going to India. So if, if America is no longer a client in terms of a customer, then in economics matters – so much. Um, how how are the Gulf states navigating that kind of logic when it comes to their their economics as divided from the security realm? Back to you. I, I believe I can make at least two or three points to answer your question. Uh, one of them about uh, United States, uh, like with the development of, of shell gas and shell oil in the United States. Some people sort of saying the United States will uh, will not be interested in the Middle East and the Gulf region because we do not we are not as dependent on the region's oil as we used to. But this argument is wrong because, as I mentioned, the United States, who is the largest economy in the world, uh, is very interested in uh, secure oil supplies to the entire world, not only the United States. For example, can you imagine if Chinese economy collapses, American economy will pay the price. The whole world will pay the price. Uh, what is happening, the global economy is interdependent. All countries depend on each other. So this is even the United States is uh, much less dependent on oil supplies from the Gulf. Uh, but United States American leaders understand that uh, American economic security, world economic security, depends on secure, secure oil supplies to the rest of the world. We still put some pressure on Japan, on India, on China to uh, contribute to Gulf security. To a great extent, we accuse Asian powers as free riders. They, they enjoy free uh, oil supplies without contributing to time security. Uh, but again, because the global economy runs on oil and the United States has the largest economy in the world, till today, the United States is committed to maritime security and the Gulf to protect uh, oil supplies to the rest of the world. Uh, there are two other issues here. Uh, one of them, uh, there is a new trend in energy. Uh, many people call it energy transition. Basically, all over the world, people are moving away from oil and gas and uh, using more renewable energy and nuclear power. Uh, oil and gas more than uh, um, oil is very polluting, gas is less polluting, but both of them pollute the environment. And because of this, many countries, almost all countries in the world, are moving away from oil and gas to renewable and nuclear, which are not polluting or less polluting. So uh, there is a big question about the uh, what Gulf states will do. Basically, what I'm trying to say, it looks in the next 30, 40 years, oil and gas will become less important. For example, all over the world, uh, the market for electric cars is expanding. Uh, again, people of the world are consuming less oil and gas. This is one point. The other point, which is very new and uh, we need some time to understand it. Uh, instead of exporting oil and gas from the Gulf 
via through uh, Strait of Hormuz and uh, the uh, Persian Gulf. Now there are talks about a pipeline from the Gulf and exporting to Europe this way. Uh, East Mediterranean with, with good relations between Israel and some GCC states. Uh, there are uh, expectations, speculations that uh, Gulf oil can be exported to Europe. Uh, European market is a large market for oil and gas. Uh, instead of going through Strait of Hormuz, then uh, the Red Sea, Suez Canal, and then uh, Europe, it will be exported by pipeline from the Gulf to Israel and from Israel, Mediterranean to Europe. This will have significant uh, geopolitical implications. And again, the uh, normalization agreement between the United Arab Emirates and Israel was signed last month, just three weeks ago, August 13. So people just started talking about this option. But again, this has the potential to change geopolitics in the region. I think you got it. Um, we're going to uh, kind of wrap it up, but I want to ask a final question um, that I think a lot of our people who follow this series will be interested in. And maybe you've already answered it um, based upon what your final comments were just then. But obviously for the Gulf, the relationship between economics and security is, is very evident. It's very self-evident because these economies are so reliant on natural resource exportation. Um, oil and natural gas and heavy mineral extraction is completely tied up in the security of the state. Um, if, if you were an outsider, whether it be you're someone who's in from Madagascar or someone who's from Montana or someone who's from Sri Lanka, um, if you were looking at the Gulf and, and trying to look at the economic trend lines, what is something that you would emphasize that people should watch um, in the next five to ten years that is going to be a trend line that will have major geopolitical, if not strategic, implications? Um, you've alluded to this already with the possibility of a pipeline to Europe, but is there anything else that pops out that you would recommend for people who, who don't have the background you do uh, to clue them in on something that you're tracking yourself? Okay, I, I, I will watch two trends, two development. One of them, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I, I'm certain that oil and gas will become less important than they used to be in the coming years. But this does not mean that oil uh, uh, Gulf states will become poor because they have had a lot of money, a lot of resources for a long time. They hired the best minds in the world. And one very smart thing they have done is to create what is called oil funds, or the official name is Southern Wealth Funds. And they have a lot of money. They have invested all over the world. And uh, at one point, uh, they were making more money out of these investments than by selling oil. Uh, again, the oil funds are the richest sovereign wealth funds in the world. So they have a lot of money and they are not poor. They will not become poor anytime soon. Uh, this is one point. Uh, the other point, uh, I believe it, it is very important to distinguish between uh, durability, how long uh, rulers stay in office and stability. In the Gulf, uh, the Gulf royal families have been in office for a very long time and there is no uh, legitimate uh, alternatives to them. Uh, I mean, the, the Saudi royal family has been in power since 1932. The change in most of these countries uh, takes the, take the form of palace coup. Basically, one member in the royal family uh, overthrows another member. But my point here, the royal families are very, uh, uh, they have been 
in office, they have been in power for a very long time. This does not mean stability. Stability means some satisfaction by, by the population, mechanism for change. This does not exist in most Gulf states. Uh, what, uh, what they are trying to do is to create what many of them call knowledge-based economy, reduce their dependency on oil and gas and start uh, selling themselves as financial hubs like Bahrain, like Dubai, like Doha are doing. Uh, basically what they need and what American leaders have encouraged them to do is to implement serious economic and political reform. Uh, my last point, this is what United States and Europe have been urging them to do. The challenge we face, on the other hand, China is pushing in the other direction. China is trying to uh, promote market its model, which is authoritarian political system with economic reform. And it looks to me most Gulf states prefer the Chinese model than the American European model. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gadet. Um, I think you you clarify some of the initial questions I had, but you also made things more complicated, which is probably the right way to end something like this, uh, talking about how all these various strands are connected, that the politics informs the economic, that informs the strategic, that informs the military, that informs the social structure of society. So um, I, I, I thank you for that because I, I, I think that part of the problem with the Gulf as it's viewed from the Indian Ocean region is the Gulf one views itself as being separated from the Indian Ocean, even though it's part of it. Um, and secondly, that it's sort of exempt um, a category in and of itself, it, it, whether that be defined purely by its economic exports or by its longstanding regimes that have, that have held on to power. Um, and that you're, you're rightfully pointing out that the, the picture is far more complicated uh, and far more interconnected. So uh, with that, my friends, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're super busy with everything that you're doing. So carving out uh, a half an hour or so this morning um, has been fantastic. Um, if you have any final comments you'd like to make, I'll turn the mic over to you. But other than that, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I'm sure we'll have you back for a future iteration of the series. Probably one last point. Uh, whatever happens in the Gulf will impact South Asia because millions of Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Filipino work in the Gulf. So the economy of the Gulf has big impact on the rest of the world, especially South Asia. Thank you, Jeff, very much. Thank you, Gada, and well said that final point. So um, again, uh, I, I appreciate you taking time. And uh, we'll see you in a future iteration. So have a good day, my friend. Thank you so much.